Well, the 172s over at Thurrock getting its um, strobe checked out. Uh, a friend of mine's asked to asked me to take his plane, ferry his plane from Manston to um, Cranfield, where he's um, he's an instructor at the um, technical college there. So um, I'm sort of I'm I'm licensed to fly this plane, but I haven't flown it recently. So um, and also it's going to be a sort of an evening stroke night flight. So um, it should be quite interesting. What I'm going to try and do in this uh, during this flight is just show you how to use the GPS. Um, I'm sure there are very good videos on how exactly to use the GPS, but this is more of a sort of a practical guide as to how you can use it in in uh, a typical sort of private pilot situation. So um, the Moon is an extremely fast plane, so it won't take us long. But um, I'm just going to um, take you through the planning stage and then we'll we'll move on to um flying the actual route in the air so um currently we're planning to start at manston we're going to use the real world weather which isn't too too uh, uh malevolent at the moment and we're going to start off around about uh, four o'clock which means it will probably get dark as we fly there so as far as the fuel and payload goes um i'm going to just check the fuel We've got 75% in the tanks, and so and that's fair enough. Um, the you never take fuel off a plane; you can only ever put it in. So you have to think quite carefully about um, whether whether or not you want to put any more fuel in, because all fuel is load. So um, let's have a look at the flight planner. So we now what what you can do. Let me just cancel that for a second. What you can do is put in your current location um, but in fact you'll see that if you do use the uh, FSX flight planner it will ask you if you want to uh, be planted at the location that you specify in the flight planner so in fact you can just sort of bypass a, st a step there so we'll say um, Echo Golf Mike Hotel which is Manston and um, we'll start at uh, one of the gates I'm just going to guess a gate at random um, and as far as the destination airport, well, we want to go to Cranfield, so there's no need to clear out any of the old fields up here. You just can type in Cranfield, and there it is. It's uh, Echo Golf Tango Charlie. So we'll double click on that because um, we're only interested in the airport, and we don't, you know, have to specify whether we're going to end at the gate or whatever. Now, um, the VFR, believe it or not, you can actually fly VFR after dark. So. Um, we could do a flight uh, purely by visual means, but um, for the, these purposes, I'm going to click IFR. And although we're going to use the GPS, I'm not going to go direct because direct GPS just literally draws a straight line between your uh, departure and your destination airfields. And that almost is never what you want because it's going to get you into all sort of trouble with busting airspaces. So let's do our old favorite VOR to VOR and find the route and see what it comes up with. Now, um, apologies again for the land disappearing, but here we are in the southeast corner of Kent at Manston, and this is where we want to get to the northwest corner of London, Cranfield. Now, if I um, just carry on zooming in a bit, you can see that we, we're going pretty well. We're skirting around the south end airspace, and we're skirting around the um, Stansted Echo Golf Sierra Sierra airspace, so we're, we're going okay, and then... Um, we turn northwest and end up busting straight through um, Luton. So that's not ideal, is it? Um, really, what we could do, we could we could stay south of Luton. We could certainly um, go to Bovingdon, which is um, a um, a VOR. There we are. Um, it's actually located in the same place as a, as an intersection. So these little triangles are intersections. In fact, you can turn those off. That, there we are. That makes that a bit easier to understand, doesn't it? So Bovingdon's a VOR. It's 113.75, and it's got a square and a hexagon, so it's giving us um, <clears throat> directional indication and uh, DME, distance measuring um, equipment distances as well. But the problem comes really after Bovingdon, because um, what we really want is another nice little... VOR about here don't we so that we could then we could skirt round the airspace and then cut north 
So in fact, I think the best thing to do will probably actually be to not to try and go south of Stansted and Luton, but to actually go north. So let's adjust the um, planner to take us north. Now let's go, we'll go up to um, Earl's Colne. Earl's Colne is a tiny, tiny strip, and I think it's a grass strip, and we're, we're not going to see it, but we are just going to use it as um, a navigation point. And then we've got Cambridge here, so that's, uh, again, that's quite a large air field, so we might want to use that, although there is, um, right next to it, there's a danger area, <coughs> Cambridge University, which extends to 100,000 feet, so... My guess is that they're firing lasers or something uh, on the top of that, so um, we don't really want to get too close to that. Um, let's have another think. Well, we're pretty desperate, aren't we? So what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to just make up a waypoint. So I'll make up a waypoint about here, just to keep us away from Cambridge. And now then from there we can probably go straight to Cranfield so that's put in a waypoint it's called itself waypoint one and here it is on the list and you can step through these waypoints so it's quite essential that we delete these waypoints isn't it now that we don't want so we don't want uh, Brookman Park anymore now let's have a look there we are we're going straight to it now there is another danger area here can you see that and that's naught to 6,000 feet, so we have to avoid that. So the best thing to do would probably be to add in one more waypoint, which is Echo Golf, Sierra Bravo, Castle Mill. And again, we're not really um, worried about that as anything other than a waypoint. Now, even at this stage, I'm thinking if we land to the southwest which is we probably will do if the prevailing wind is southwesterly um we are going to want to uh go here aren't we to the outer marker so we're going to want to sort of line up line up pretty well here so let's put in a waypoint here in fact we could probably delete sierra bravo uh let's delete that and have a look at that it takes us a little bit close to that doesn't it so let's ping that down to Mike Juliet which is little uh, Mike Juliet yeah which is little Granston so um, just looking overall at the route that's I reckon that's pretty good we've got a danger area here restrict area over up to 2,000 feet so we need to be above 2,000 feet and then we have the Shoebury Nest Danger Area, which is um, a gun range. But I know for a fact that they're not active at night. So we will be able to go um, directly over the gun range. So let's have a look. So that's, that's looking pretty good. Now the cruising altitude, we can cruise at uh, 4,000. Because 4,000 will take us over the top of that. So I'm quite hyped with that. So let's save that and save it as IFR Manston to Cranfield because it's quite um, helpfully gives that a good a name and um, if you want to print out the nav log we can um, alternatively um, we can refer to it on the knee board so and that's what I'm going to do now here's that thing I was telling you about do you want flight simulator to move your aircraft to the departure airport listed on the flight plan now why wouldn't you well the answer is that sometimes you're filing a flight plan in mid-air and you have to give it a start airfield and a destination airfield and then what you're going to do is you're going to pick up the flight plan halfway through in mid-air in which case you don't really want to go back to the beginning and start again on the ground so under those circumstances you say no if you're flight planning in mid-air but here we're not so we do want to move to the departure airfield and there we go so uh, I'm going to save that whole scenario uh, and what are you can just call it temp um, and then make it the default flight and then if anything goes wrong like for example if um, you crash into a fuel trunk within two seconds of starting mm -hmm. you don't have to um, redo the whole lot all over again and so we're now going to click on fly now
Now, as I say, the moon is a lovely plane and uh, is very fast. That's a bit more like it, isn't it? Now, that is where I would expect to find the plane at Manston, which, as I say, is my, my local airfield. Um, and we are going to be departing... Let's have a look. I'm going to press Shift Z. Just have a quick look at the wind. And it's 236 magnetic at 6 knots. So that's... Um, that's pretty much a southwesterly, isn't it? That's exactly what we'd expect. So let's press Shift Z a couple more times to get rid of that, and then we'll just go about starting this up. Now, as I say, you'll have to bear with me because I haven't flown this plane for a while. So I'm going to uh, do something which is going to be, I'm sure, highly humorous and try and start it manually. So, as you know, what we need to do is we need to give it fuel, so we need to push in the mixture, we need to give it uh, electricity and then we need to um, do the mags first of all just make sure the brakes are on so the mags you press M and then plus plus there's not much uh, oh yes that's alright that's fine so that started up okay let's have a quick look then so we've got fuel fuel is the most important thing to be honest um, when you're flying a plane you can't pull into a cloud and fill up so let's put the um, alternators on and uh, the master all the radio masters etc now we need to find out what we've got in the way of uh, screens so I'm pressing that's shift F2 is bringing up the comms stack. Shift F3 brings up the GPS. 4 brings up the warning lights. Shift 5 uh, brings up the, uh, the basically the overhead lighting panel. So let's get the um, I think the rotating beacon and the taxi light are already on. The strobes on. Um, the recognition lights are on and we might as well push on the landing lights. So that's all the lights on. <clears throat> that was um, now. That was um, shift five. If you press one of the shift keys and you've got user tips turned on, it will tell you what's mapped to what. So you've, um, and that's telling me that there are no more shift keys to press. So let's. Um, oh, that's nice. So it has got strobes. That's good. Well, this one's got strobes anyway. Now it's shift F10 for the knee board and you keep pressing shift F10 and that will cycle through that and we can just very gently click on the bottom and drag that down now you can see that uh, we're climbing up we're, we're at Mike Hotel the first uh, waypoint is going to be Echo Golf Sierra Romeo and we expect to be at uh, 4,000 feet and we're going to be heading 325 to get there and uh, it's 42.3 miles and the ground speed is pretty quick 179 knots that's that's pretty well well that's you know around about 200 miles an hour and in a straight line that is very quick we're looking at about 100 nautical miles and they're expecting to burn about 55 pounds of fuel and it's only going to take us half an hour and that's to get from one side of London to the other and not even in a straight line that's um, that's pretty good so let's shut that temporarily now get the old um, the GPS going now you can see that the flight plan that we put in is already on the GPS and if I zoom out by increasing the range increasing the range is zooming out you'll see that uh, our first leg is already in there to Echo Golf Sierra Romeo so we're going to fly this because this is a posh plane it's more expensive than anything I can afford this plane so but it's a bit of a treat for me to fly it so I'm going to fly this on the autopilot because um, I don't want to be concentrating on flying the plane at the same time um, that um, I'm, I'm sort of talking can't do two things at the same time we're going to be taking off to the west which is this direction and then we're going to expect to turn right aren't we to um, get ourselves on track for Sierra Romeo so there are two um, 
knobs down here there's there's the big knob left and right and the smaller knob left and right now the big knob obviously tends to do big things uh, like change between complete groups of pages and the smaller one tends to do smaller things so it changes between two pages as you can see here you can see from these two squares it's changing between the two pages in the group now if you get stuck at all with the autopilot uh, with the the GPS just press and hold clear press and hold it and then it'll flash and it'll reset itself so don't worry at all if you um, if you get into a panic with it or whatever just press and hold clear start again from the beginning so shift F3 to get rid of that now there's one more little bit of um, planning we need to do and that is we need to tell the autopilot that we're going to be using the uh, the GPS for directions rather than the uh, the, the uh, nav boxes. Remember the nav boxes use the VORs and, and that's this switch here. Can you see it says nav GPS? There is one plane that doesn't have the nav GPS button uh, in the default FSX. I can't remember, I think I might remember which one it is later but um, at the moment this is telling the autopilot to take its instructions from the, the nav boxes and therefore the, the VORs and what we want to do is just shift that over to GPS and then we can now we can tell it to uh, take it from the GPS right and we're going to be flying at 4000 feet so let's bring up the um, comm stack and set this up here's the uh, autopilot we'll tell it 4000 feet and we'll tell it uh, vertical speed of um, no plus would be better, wouldn't it? Rather than negative. Negative is uh, not a climb. There we are. Twelve hundred plus twelve hundred. That's a climb. And then uh, we're going to be telling it to uh, fly, to navigate for us, and also to handle the altitude. Uh, and, watch, and eventually we'll ask it to do the um, well. Uh, heading heading actually is slightly different heading is where you set a heading and it will then follow that heading here we're going to do more than just a heading we're going to ask it to navigate for us so we're going to we're going to click on nav and altitude now um, it won't work until we press the AP button so what you can do is you can just arm it like that so we've got the right altitude we've got the right um, um, well we've approximated a climb so that's fine um, and we can leave it like that and then eventually we can then when we want to we can press the AP button and that will get it started so shift F2 to get rid of that and let's uh, just say uh, Manson Tower uh, November 123 Mike Sierra requesting radio check and taxi for departure to the west and once they've uh, told us the readback is 5 which is 5 out of 5 for readability we um, just zoom back out to my favourite 0.5 and um, start taxiing out now don't forget what we're doing we're looking for things like compass moving one way this compass moving the other the um, turn coordinator moving in the correct direction The ball skidding in the correct direction, so we're turning left, so the ball skidding right. Now, if I remember, the last time I borrowed this plane, uh, it's very quick in the descent. It's described as the Porsche, the Porsche of uh, aircraft. So, we're going to get there quickly. The other thing, of course, is I have to remember is that uh, unlike the 172, it's got retractable undercarriage. So, uh, while we probably could fly there with the undercarriage down the whole way, it's not uh, generally regarded as a good idea. So, we must remember to pull it up when we're climbing out and drop it back. But I'm, I hope what you're going to see is that a lot of the principles, because this is the first time we've actually flown a different plane together. A lot of the principles that uh, apply to the 172 that we've already discussed 
actually still apply to this plane. So for example when we're climbing we are going to climb at the top of the white band here. Now that's 110 knots. You remember on the old 172 it was um, 85 knots. So we wouldn't want to climb this plane at 85 knots. You could see it would be, it would be ridiculously slow. Um, so aerodynamically it's telling you straight away it wants to climb at about 110 knots. So that's what we'll be aiming for. Now the other thing it's got is a variable pitch propeller. We may not get a chance to go into that this time because um, I might have to cover that on the trip back uh, if he wants me to fly it back. But um, that's a, a propeller which is capable of varying its the angle of attack. In other words, how much, uh, how coarse or how fine it is as it's as it's going round, and it changes itself uh, pretty much like a. A hotel, a, a hotel. Not many have flying hotels that I know about. A, a helicopter, a helicopter rotor blades. What I'm trying to say, hotel blade. Now let's um, do a quick run up. Kind of just point myself pretty much into wind. Uh, and if you remember, now I'm holding it on the brakes. And what we do is we make sure that the mixture's in and then we uh, rev it up to pretty much as much as we can without um, starting to move forward which in, yeah, in this case is pretty good actually I'm still moving forward slightly and then uh, I'll just check the magnetos you can see so M minus minus that's the right magnetos and back to both and L and back to both and checking all the um, temperatures and pressures and everything's fine because this is what the, we can ask this plane to do this in a few minutes or in, in, a, in a few seconds so we might as well do it on the ground and just make sure it can do everything on the ground and then lastly gently bring it right back and check it doesn't stall and it's not stalling that's fine now here just uh, zoom in a bit. Here you can see that the um, wing flaps are up at the moment and this is the sort of takeoff range. So we can we can have them we can have them fully up or we can have them down for one stage for taking off. Now in in this case um, I'm going to keep them up because um, we've got a massive great long runway and the, and the wind's pretty well down the runway so I'm not too worried. So we call Manson Tower uh, ready for departure in November Mike Sierra and they'll um, give us a clearance to take off, check down the runway that nothing's coming. This is about the point at which you want to turn on your strobe. Um, which was five wasn't it? So we've got all our lights on, that's fine. So, we need to turn right as we take off and climb to 4,000 feet, so. Let's just stop here for a second. Now, I'll show you on here, you can see here, we're gonna be steering about 320. So that's the um, angle that you want to remember. So hold it on the brakes just wind the throttle up and then full throttle off the brakes and off we go. It's pulling to the left a bit because of the gyroscopic uh, effect of the engine rapidly spilling in engine and propeller. So we're in the white band now on the airspeed and rapidly accelerating. doing 80 so let's just that's it. wait until it's it's happy to take off and that's happily off so now we can put the gear up put the gear up when you're pretty sure you're not going to come down again
Now the, the flight director here governs this uh, yellow uh, banana and the banana is telling us what we need to do both in terms of vertical and uh, lateral movement so the idea is to put the orange The orange symbol, which stays static, underneath the, um, the yellow banana, and it is called a banana. So uh, everybody calls it a banana. Now, down here, you can see that um, we're. If this was a VOR, we'd be pretty close to it, and in fact, we are. Flying 340, so let's just check on the GPS. There we are. We're flying, we're flying in a way that we're going to acquire that GPS track. Now I didn't zero the uh, barometer, so I'll just press B and see what's happened to the barometer. So we're, we're obviously not as high as we thought we were. And I didn't press D to adjust the DI, so let's just press D and that's a much smaller adjustment and I am I'm still trying to climb um, keeping this round about the 110 mark and as you can see we're doing it totally on instruments we're going straight up to 4,000 feet on instruments now let's have a look at the GPS again now that's pretty good isn't it that's pretty I'm pretty happy with that now you can resize this um, I think you can actually get on the corner of it, but um, it's, that's pretty tricky. So what I'm going to do is just resize it by dragging the side and the top. Follow the banana. Now let's have a look at some stats. It's telling us the next um, waypoint is Echo Golf Sierra Romeo. We need, it's on a bearing of 325 degrees magnetic, so that's what we need to steer, so that's what we should be looking for about here. Um, the course to steer is 303, 3, 314 degrees magnetic. Now, the reason for that is the wind. Just watching the altitude. Um, so what, what it's saying is that uh, we need to steer further left than you think, and that's obviously because we've got a bit of wind coming from the right. Um, the estimated time of arrival is at 16.34 local and as you can see from the clock here it's 16.18 so that's not that long, it's about 17 minutes time. Um, and the um, track error is 5 degrees, in other words we're 5 degrees off track. In fact I'm going to put the GPS away for a minute because um, we're about to level off so. Just uh, now remember leveling off his attitude power trim. So, so, so much for using the um, GPS in the climb then. So, we level off, don't dive down too much. I'm just um, going to throttle back as well because this is a quick plane. We're already doing 150 knots and we've only literally just leveled off. We're right out over the edge. So, there's the airfield where we took off. That's, um, oh, I don't know if that was lightning. That's Whitstable, and that's um, the Isle of Sheppey, and we're off over towards Essex. Now I'm just getting this settled down. Don't tell me the gear's still down. No, the gear's on. Right, so we're cruising at about 150 knots, and we're certainly not on full throttle. We need to um, look down here at the um, RPM and you see the RPM doesn't change but the manifold pressure does. So that's we'll explain that why because normally you would expect the um, RPM to change wouldn't you if you adjusted the throttle and certainly in a car it would but um, that's the um, constant speed prop that's doing that. 
Now, how do we use the GPS then to help us thread our way through this all this complicated airspace? And the answer is, if we, we just bring it up, you can see this uh, leg is purple, isn't it? Let's put the range up. Whereas you can see um, the next leg is green, and that's because the, the purple leg is the current leg. And I promised that... Um, let's just put that up there for a second. I love the way that snaps into the corner because they didn't used to do that and that was a big uh, improvement when that came along and I said that um, we are going to use the um, the autopilot for this and I'm going to do that I'm just going to press AP now, it almost always makes a turn initially because it is it's trying to do what's happening is as you can see from here we are about 0.2 nautical miles um, off the track and what it's doing is it's just correcting us and taking us back on the track. If we zoom right in, can you see that we are we are actually left of that track? You can't see it when you zoom out, but when you zoom in you can. We're just going over South End. Now, another thing is, you'll, you'll see this is flashing a message here, message. So if you click message, airspace ahead, less than 10 minutes. Okay, press message to continue again. So it's telling us about the Southampton airspace and it will keep doing that and really that's not that brilliantly useful oh, it's a nice cloud isn't it that's not brilliantly useful so what you can do you can if you press and hold that that it will come up off and that means that just turns the messages off now carrying around here we've got our ground speed which is 167 knots and you can see here that our airspeed is around about 160 knots so we've got a slight uh, tailwind this uh, is telling us that we're pretty well back on completely on track now because we've got a track area of one percent and we are uh, three hundredths of a nautical mile off track so it's doing a very good job of getting us back on track um, we've got uh, estimated time on route is eight minutes so it's eight minutes before we get to Sierra Romeo our uh, our track is 325 degrees magnetic, and that's exactly equal to our desired track. Uh, so we are we're we're obviously we're well, we're well on course. And then the distance to Echo Golf Sierra uh, Sierra Romeo, which is our next waypoint, is 24 nautical miles. So really, th that's all pretty well um, um, hunky dory there, and uh, we don't need to worry about that. Everything's going fine. So let's put the GPS away for a bit. Now, if you um, zoom in, or if I zoom in rather here, you can see that although the needle's lined up, the actual dial itself isn't um, centered. And we can center it by, by moving it, but it makes absolutely no difference at all. It doesn't matter which direction that needle's pointing because it's just a it's just a sign that we are um, following the GPS track um, if you if you put it up to the top like that it will tell you what GPS track it is that we're following now the other thing is this is this is the heading bug and again you can set this to absolutely anything um, and if you set that to a particular heading and then change this from nav to heading it will follow the heading bug so let's say if we we just um, put it a few degrees to the right and change that to heading don't know if you saw the plane moving there but you can see here from the dial that the plane is turning right and it is now starting to follow that heading and that's just a brute force uh, a way to override um, the um, autopilot if we now change that back to nav you'll see that it's turning back now to um, reacquire the GPS track and the needles uh, which is just slightly off centre after a while is going to centre Now the other thing you can do see is this is doing this brilliantly because it's not gaining or losing 50 feet while it's turning left and right and uh, uh, you can see that from the vertical speed meter um, the uppy downy thing being um, absolutely totally um, unfazed and completely on track now this thing's so fast that we are now over Essex and uh, if we get the um, 
we can see now that we are six minutes away Now this, the, the uh, DME equipment really is not much use with the GPS because this takes its uh, reading from the VORs. I think this is, um, seems to be some sort of extension of the uh, autopilot, doesn't it? Now, if I can remember shift 5, we can actually probably turn some of these off. So, really, the landing light we don't need on, recognition and strobe we certainly do, and the taxi lights we don't. So, it's um, 1, 3, 4, and 6 that we need on when we're flying. Ooh. Now, now, I didn't mean to do that. Um, what you saw was I gave the yoke a massive great bang. And the reason why I was a little bit um, concerned when I did it was because... Um, uh, on some planes it is a way to disconnect the autopilot. If the autopilot sees you making inputs into the uh, yoke it will assume it's because you're not flying where you want to go and you're trying to fly somewhere else. So it will dis rather than fight you it will just disconnect itself. And while I'm a bit reluctant to experiment with this sort of thing in mid-air I think we'll find that yeah, it's pretty well resistant to whatever we do with the yoke. Good. Now the other thing we've got on is the booster pump. Um, and in fact we don't really need the fuel pump on. So if I can find a way of turning it off I will. I don't remember turning it on. might have to do what I absolutely hate which is switch to the 2D cockpit and try and find it but even there I don't think I can't really see it you can probably see it I can't see it oh here we are Who's the one? what am I talking about yeah yeah it's on the dashboard Right, the um, vacuum, as I said, a lot of the instruments are driven by vacuum. Actually, we'll come back to that because I think we're probably coming up to a turning point. Yeah. Now, in three minutes, we're coming up to a turning point. Um, you can't scroll this map up and down like you can with the um, flight planner. All you can do is um, zoom in and out. But um, we're going to be coming up to a turning point in three minutes, but in fact it's not really a turning point as such because uh, we're going to be going straight over it, aren't we? In fact, you can already see the destination there. That's how fast this plane is. I mean, it is really, it really does shift this plane. So let's get rid of the uh, GPS and get back to where we were. Oh, let's get rid of this as well. This ghastly 2D display. Although it is useful. With the, when you've got a... Um, one of these um, head things that moves your head around. I've got one, Track IR. Once, once you use that, then everything's fine. Because you can, what you can do is you can sort of tilt your head and have a look around the yokes. And then on some of the planes, you can click the yokes and the yokes will disappear, which is a little bit artificial, but it does um, get around the problem that the yokes quite frequently obscure the, um, what's going on. I'm going to zoom in a bit because I don't think it's fair on you to have everything so small. So let's stick in 0.7 for the time being. So where was I? Oh, that's right. Yes, yes, of course, yes. So um, standby vacuum is... Uh, a lot of the um, instruments are vacuum driven. For example, the, um, the uh, compass. Not, not the actual compass compass, but the um, the vacuum compass. <laughs> and um, so if the vacuum fails, you've got a standby vacuum source. 
Um, you've got a prop de-icer, which is useful if um, you're in freezing rain and you're getting ice all over your prop. You've got a pito heat, which is useful if you're in freezing rain and the uh, small tube that points forwards on the left hand on the plane and measures your forward airspeed it starts to ice up because then your airspeed starts to drop off and you start thinking that you're flying slower than you are. The booster pump really just... Um, well, I've got a warning light come up here. No? Have we? No? No, we haven't, no. Um, so the booster pump just puts extra pressure in the fuel system, which is good for when you're changing tanks. And the elevator trim uh, automatically trims the elevator. So when you've sort of leveled off, it will apply elevator trim to um, uh, relieve the pressure on the on the yoke, on the flying on this on this thing down here, the flying stick. So that and that's that's great because um, otherwise you would be trimming the um, plane the whole time. Now. Because I, part of the philosophy of this series is to try and show you how you can fly with not a lot of expense. Um, I'll tell you, I've got a pretty old Microsoft Sidewinder force feedback stick. And it's so old that the force feedback thing's completely broken. And I think at one time I um, took it apart and I just took the springs out. Um, so in fact, my, my joystick doesn't centre. Now that's good in a, in a way or bad in a way it's good because it means that I can almost leave it at any angle and if that's the right angle to fly the plane then that's fine it'll just stay there if it returned to the center all the time I would have to be constantly trimming up um, but on the other hand it is slightly unrealistic in that uh, I can I don't I don't have to worry about any of the sort of feedback on the yoke that uh, the trimming an aircraft is designed to prevent Now there's a few other things on here. Um, there's the variable pitch propeller, which I was talking about, which I'm just going to pull back slightly. Now as I do, you watch the RPM and you'll see that the RPM will fall. Can you see that? Let's just zoom in a bit. There we are. So I said I'd show you the RPM and the variable pitch and that's what works the, the um, RPM. Now what that's doing when it uh, when I pull it back a bit is it's forcing the propeller to be slightly more angled in respect of the airflow uh, we just I'm just going to keep track of the turning points because we are coming up to a turning point shortly we've got some um, stancid on our left there somewhere can't really see it through the cloud Uh, yeah, so it forces the propeller to be sort of coarser in pitch, we say, towards the, the airflow. And the best way to think of that is if you're used to driving a car, when you start off in a car, if you're driving a manual car, you'll start off in first gear, which is a very low gear, and it, it means that the, you can move the car quite easily at um, low speeds. Um, and then as you get faster, you want to change up into second gear because you've got, much, you, you've got almost no inertia to overcome by then. So you can... Uh, change the gearing between the engine and the wheels uh, so that the power is applied more efficiently until eventually when you're on the motorway all you've got really is rolling resistance and wind resistance and so you can have the engine uh, power applied through quite a high gear and that's what a variable pitch propeller is like it's when it's very very fine as it goes round, it cuts a small amount of air so it's capable of taking a plane from a standing start and applying quite a bit of um, effort to get it get it going but then as um, the plane gets faster and faster and as you can see we're doing about 160 knots here the propeller needs to to, to um, cut the same amount of air every time it would have to speed up tremendously in fact it'll have to speed up so it'll be you know spinning several hundred thousand times a minute so what it does to compensate is it it just changes its angle slightly so it's taking a slightly bigger bite of air every time it goes round so that as it goes forward through the air it can uh, compensate for the speed by taking a bigger bite of air but but st keeping the same rotation rotational speed same number of R rpm now the reason why that's a good idea is because most engines produce the maximum torque the maximum power 
at a certain RPM and again you know that yourself in a car if you try and uh, do certain things at a very low revs the car won't pull away if you try and do the same things at extremely high revs the engine's got nothing more to give you but there's a, there's a sweet spot really in terms of the RPM for an engine where it's really you know got the grunt and where it's really capable of doing all the work so by having a variable pitch propeller what you're doing is you are uh, instead of varying the RPM of the engine you're keeping the RPM of the engine constant where it's going to be the most efficient and you are using the propeller to vary the amount of work that it's doing so when you need more um, work out of it at slow speeds you, you find the propeller and when it's most efficient to uh, have a, a coarser pitch propeller at high speeds you can adjust the propeller and you don't have to speed the engine up to go faster you sort of vary the pitch in the propeller and the engine stays at a constant RPM and then um, and then you get best fuel efficiency and you get best um, power out of the engine now we're two minutes away from our next turning point which is uh, waypoint one which is the artificial point that we put in so we're on the Echo Golf Sierra Romeo to waypoint one leg and you can see that's that's all happened entirely automatically the leg uh, we're on a new leg and the leg that we're on has gone purple we're coming up to the uh, the next leg the next leg shown in white and this is going to be a turning point so we are going to um, we are going to notice this now I said about the pages and sub pages within the group this is the um, uh, page where the aircraft where the map is oriented with the aircraft pointing up and if we press the small right arrow it will go to the alternative way of looking things which is with north up so if you ever get confused about which direction you're flying in this is the one you want to be looking at As you can see there we're going northwest here um, if it wasn't for the compass rose we wouldn't really know what direction we're flying in because the plane always points up so let's get rid of that shift 3 it is getting dark isn't it Now it's time for a Frida check. So F, F in Frida stands for fuel. So we've got plenty of uh, fuel in both tanks and about the same amount of fuel in both tanks, which is good. So it shows we're using it equally because that's going to put the plane out of balance if the fuel starts coming out of one tank and not the other. The radio, well, we're not doing uh, uh, comms or navs, but we are doing GPS. So and I'm just um, I'm just going to ask myself am I happy with how the GPS is working and at the moment I am happy it seems to be doing pretty much what we wanted it to um, the e engine E is for engine so we'll look at the um, amperes now can you see we've reached that waypoint now so we are now there and there's an airfield down there I don't know if you can see that but that's probably um, Cambridge isn't it and this is the plane now the plane's doing all of this I'm not doing this at all so, um, and in fact, when you have a plane that flies this fast, really, you know, you, 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 this is how you want to fly, you know, you don't want to be doing this manually. So the fuel pressure is fine, the oil pressure is fine, the outside air temperature is um, just below zero. We've got, um, now let's just zoom in and see what we've got. TT, TIT. Don't ask me what that is. This is the um, cylinder head temperature, which is fine. That's quite tall, cool. The oil temperature is fine. I, I don't know. That's the outside air temperature. I don't know what that is. Anyway, it's in the green. Who cares? It's in the green. Who cares? We don't mind. We like things in the green. And now everything else is fine. So, what we're going to do now is refer to our maps and books because we're going to be landing at Cranfield so we need to know a little bit of information about Cranfield so it would have been better to have done this on the ground wouldn't it but you carry all this stuff in your bag and the other good thing is that um, if you fly with people then 
it's so much nicer because you don't have to do all this yourself. Cranfield is a tarmac runway and it's quite a long one. Um, and there is a cran there there is a VOR Cranfield 116 decimal five on the airdrome, which I think was in our flight plan. And the runway we're going to be using is two one, so it's it's the runway that's aligned in the uh, 210 degrees and obviously if you were to land on it the other way if in the rear uh, case that we have a northeasterly wind you'd be landing on runway 03 and it's quite long it's about 1800 meters long so it, it has an ILS um, which is something that we might um, we might just dial that in we might use it we might not and the ILS is uh, 108.9 and that's another radio nav type uh, facility that um, works a bit like a VOR but it really only uh, relates to runways now we're going to get there pretty quickly at this rate so I'm just going to keep I'm going to keep there we are keep an eye on this because um, I don't want to get caught out because I don't want to arrive over Cranfield at 4,000 feet, of course. So we go to two. Now we're going to dial in their um, 108.9, which is their ILS. And we do that in the nav one. So let's dial in 108.9 and change that over and then. Um, well, if we, we, we're going to need to ident it, and the Morse code that comes with it is ICR, and I know I is dot dot, so if it starts off with dot dot, that will be good, won't it? Now, that means that what we're going to have to do is change over our navigation to um, from GPS over to nav, because while this, while this button's on GPS, it's not going to take any notice at all of these of the nav boxes. It is literally just taking taking uh, everything off the GPS here. And we've got three minutes to go to the next waypoint, which is Echo Golf Mike Juliet. Now, did you hear that? That was the Morse code ident for the uh, Cranfield ILS come come up there. Let's listen again. Right, that's ICR, so I've got a little da-di-da-da, etc. So I'm happy that that's, that's serviceable and that's working okay. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to start to um, descend because I don't want to, um, as I say, arrive sort of red, red hot at 4,000 feet over Cranfield. So to descend, it's um, power attitude trim. Attitude power trim to level off at the top of climb, power attitude trim um, to go down. So we're just going to pull the power back slightly and watch the um, airspeed here. Now what will happen of course is that the plane will not descend because it's at the moment it's uh, being held at 4,000 feet on the um, on the autopilot. So if we want to descend we're going to have to tell it roughly what height we want to descend to. And I've dialed in 2,800 there and it's it's pre-selected uh, a 700 feet per minute descent and if you look here you can see it's it's pretty well gone straight into that so it's it's pretty quick now I'm going to press B to adjust the barometric pressure again and did you see it jump did you see that jump it went up to nearly 4,000 feet again so because we failed to adjust the barometric pressure as we've moved around the country we've actually probably ended up flying slightly too high and reducing the safety margins there. While we're flying in a straight line I'll press D to adjust the uh, DI. And I'm just going to drop back the throttle a little bit more because we're still going, because we're going down of course we picked up speed. So we're still going at 140 knots which is a heck of a heck of a speed. I mean to give you an idea um, a large jet 
when it's coming in will probably slow down to something like this sort of speed. So we're flying at the same sort of speed that a 737 or an A319 would fly in this sort of airspace. So that's, that's very quick for a small plane. Now when this reaches 2,800 feet it's going to very helpfully level off. So I'll just get rid of that shift 2 for the time being and press shift 3 again and see how we're doing. So we're one minute away from this waypoint and uh, then we've still got quite a way to go so I'll put the throttle up a little bit again. Now we saw that we have our flight plan on the knee ball, but can we find the flight plan on the GPS? And the answer is yes you can. Just press FPL for flight plan and it tells us we're going from uh, Manston, Mike Hotel to Tango Charlie or Cranfield. And there's all the legs and that it's got a small purple thing that's showing us what leg we're flying. And it's telling us that we've got two miles to go. And these are all the individual distances and this is the cumulative distance. So we've got 22 nautical miles to go. How do you get back? Just press clear. If that doesn't work, press and hold clear and it'll always take you back. Now 22 nautical miles, if we're doing 120 nautical miles an hour, let's say, let's just throttle up a little bit, um, is is um, we're doing sort of two nautical miles a minute so 60 nautical miles an hour is a mile a minute isn't it so 120 nautical miles an hour is two miles every minute and we're only 22 miles away so that's literally by the time you've worked that out you're only it's 10 minutes <laughs> it's just over 10 minutes so things as i say it's not like sailing things happen very quick in a plane let me put that back over that over that side because i want to keep this side free for um looking out for the airfield. Throttle up a bit more. Now you can see what we're spot on 2,800 feet and if I press shift 2 bring up the radio stack uh, that's what we're after 2,800. So let's I'll just get rid of the radio the comms and um, now, do you remember what I said about the uh, DI not making any difference where it was pointing? You can see here that we're still bang on track, but obviously we have turned left. So it's showing our heading, and it's showing that we're on track. But um, where that's pointing really is, doesn't make any difference at all. What I tend to do is I tend to try and keep the heading bug aligned with the actual heading of the plane. And the reason for that is that if for any reason the autopilot cut off then I could just tell it straight away I should just say take over fly the heading bug and the plane would just carry straight on. If the heading bugs all over the place or pointing backwards or something and, and your GPS packs up you've got a bit of a problem trying to sort out the heading bug and switch the GPS off at the same time. And uh, um, I'll show you that in a minute because we're going to stop using the autopilot in a minute. Certainly for lateral navigation, we can still use it for up and down. I'm going to just ask it to take us down a little bit more, 2,400 feet. And as we go down, obviously the speed goes up, and once it gets down there, it levels off and the speed goes down again. So you have to just keep a little eye, eye out for um, your um, your speed. So are we pretty happy? We're going to have to start doing things like flaps and gear and everything in a minute, aren't we? So let's just uh, press Shift A. Let's put the booster pump on. We don't need the pito heat or the prop DI, so I don't think. Um, I'll press A to get back, and then uh, I think it was uh, five, wasn't it, for the lights? So let's put the um, landing light on. 
We're not really worried about the taxi light at the moment. Let's keep the um, the GPS open and zoom in a bit. Now, the green I don't know what you call that flechette, whatever. The green arrow represents the the cone in which the landing the the radio landing system works, or at least it represents the cone where you should be if you want to land on the runway using the landing system and that's that uh, that's that thing I dialed in do you remember that uh, 108 decimal 9 so in a second what we're going to do we're going to turn left we're going to disengage the GPS and we're going to fly on the heading bug in fact let's do that now the heading bug is pretty well okay I'm going to go to the um, comm stack and I'm going to press heading and that will then deselect navigation. There we go. And you see it changes to HDG. There's a slight change in the um, there's a slight change in the uh, direction of the plane as it just slightly. Um, in fact, you can if you see that you can move the heading bug slightly to the right so it gets back on the track it was because it with heading bug. Um, really just points the plane and doesn't really uh, take much account of wind whereas the nav mode will follow a line a GPS line and so that does does take account of wind I'm going to slow down a little bit more now so now we've got the autopilot holding the altitude and just doing the lateral navigation based on the heading bug so we can literally now if we want to we can we can we can turn this heading bug to the right the plane will turn to the right and maintain 2400 feet so I don't have an approach plate for Cranfield but I'm guessing that uh, let's have a look at how high it is it's 358 feet above mean sea level I'm getting this from the book um, and so I'm I'm assuming that from the distance that we're going to approach it if we approach it about 2000 or 2500 feet that'd be about right Now, um, because we're no longer flying on the GPS, I can I can switch back to um, to nav. And if we if we switch back to nav, I don't know if I can get them both in the screen at the same time. But if you look here, we should see that the ILS indicator comes up. There we are. So do you see those yellow triangles was up there? And now we've got a an indicator that's now telling us where we are relative to the um, the runway centre line. And the centre line is uh, 214 degrees, so I'm going to turn that around to um, until I get it to about 214 degrees, and I reckon that's about right. Two, yes, that's about right. Now you can see here that the altitude that we need to be at, which is indicated by these yellow triangles, is slightly above us. And that is correct because what we want to do is um, we want to approach this from below. It's no use. You can't dive down onto one of these glide slopes from above. And here you can see we've flown through the centre line slightly. So I'm having to turn towards the runway, as you can see from the GPS, and um, and also go slightly left to um, compensate for the fact that we overdid it a bit. And the, work, the place you want the heading marker is somewhere in the gap. And as it gets closer to the line, then you want to have it more and more on the line. So we're coming up to the uh, glide slope here. In other words, where we need to be vertically. We're just about, uh, we're just about there, and we're just about on the... Um, we're just about happy on the um, centre line. So now I'm going to click APR on the uh, the GPS and what that's done is that's put us in approach mode and approach mode means that it's now going to follow the ILS down which is a, a localizer which tells it how where to steer from side to side and a glide slope separate completely separate beam which tells it how far up and down it needs to be now what I'm going to do I'm going to slow down a bit again because we're, we're too fast for flaps and if you're too fast for flaps you're too fast for landing 
So let's slow right down. Now here we're, we're, we're nothing at all to do with the GPS now. We've switched now totally onto the um, ILS mode. So you've got VORs, which we, we covered, GPS, which we covered, and now we're, we're doing ILS. And here we can look in that we're bang on the glide slope and we are pretty well bang on the, um, on the centre line. Now I'm deliberately not looking out of the window at the moment. Here we are in the white arc because we concentrate on these instruments. Here we want to um, just drop some flaps. So we make sure the mixture is rich. I'm going to push the propeller in and drop one stage of flaps. And looking now all the time at the airspeed. Okay. Do a quick uh, recalibration of the B and the D to make sure we're okay. Now don't rem remember it's 358. 90 knots. I'm going to throttle up a little bit. Drop another degree of flaps. Now that warning thing is telling me that the gear's not down, so I'm going to press G and put the gear down. And we're looking for a green indicator here. And the warning light stopped, that's fine. So a little bit more throttle. And last stage of flaps. Is it last stage of flaps or have we got all the flaps down? I think we've got all the flaps down. So now we need to do a quick bump fix check, which is uh, brakes are off, undercarriage is down, mixture's rich, that's the blue knob that we were talking about, the fuel is uh, on and sufficient for a go around, got plenty of fuel, hatches and harnesses all tight. Now now, and only now, I'm going to zoom out and see how we're doing relative to the runway. And I think you can see it's there, isn't it? If I just wind the seat up a bit. There we are. There you can see it's there. Did that by pressing shift enter. You can wind your seat up a bit. Now providing these two triangles are pretty well centered and this line is centered, you know you're pretty well centered. And here we've got um, the lights on the left hand side. We've got out of the four lights, three of them are showing white and one of them is showing red. So um, red means dead we're fine. So we're pretty well finished with the instrumentation. I'm going to get rid of the GPS and obviously as soon as we land really we're not going to be interested in the autopilot anymore but just to show you what it can do I'm going to fly it down to about um, well to another 100 feet or so and then disconnect it. You wouldn't land a plane on the autopilot and you can do it sometimes it does work just throttling back a bit. Right, I'm going to disconnect the autopilot. You get a warning beep. And now I'm flying the plane manually. I'm going to throttle back a bit more because, as I say, it's a slippery plane, this. It's quite windy, isn't it? Here, you want to have a quick look at the airport layout because you're going to be taxiing in a minute. So just uh, memorise um, where, where you're going to vacate. I'm coming in. That's it. Yeah. Just gently throttle back and fly parallel to the runway surface. Down we go. And I always like to pull all the flaps up by pressing F5 straight away. Just to uh, remember to pull the flaps up and not the gear at this point. The Shift 2 gets rid of the comms. And we're aiming to keep a little bit of speed up because we're going to vacate right at the end of the runway. The general rule of vacating runways is to vacate left. Because if you remember the pilot sits on the left and so obviously he's going to have the best view, isn't he, of, of where to... Oh, hello. I'm going to... I'm going to could have gone up there, couldn't I? I was talking too much. I could have gone up there, but... I've missed it and I'm, I'm not going to turn around and taxi back up the wrong way, that's pretty bad. So let's just um, go up the end here. So what have we learned today? Well, um, we've learned that a lot of the functions that apply to one plane apply to them all, um, such as the uh, climbing at the white band and that sort of thing. 
We've done quite a bit of work on uh, flight planning now, haven't we, both within FSX and uh, demonstrated how that transfers across to the GPS. We've done a lot of um, how to use the GPS, what to expect, pretty basic functions. That GPS has got a lot more functionality than that, but um, perhaps we can go into that on a future flight. Um, we've done flying at night, this is the first uh, night flight we've done. We've done flying on the autopilot, that's the first time we've done that. And we've done an ILS approach. So uh, all in all, I think that uh, we can say that's a pretty successful flight. Not only that, we've actually delivered the plane in one piece. Which is, uh, <laughs> when you're flying a plane that doesn't belong to you, especially a nice one like this, a very expensive one, is, uh, is always a good idea. So, I'll, um, I'll put the plane away, we can write the logs up, and then we'll go and find the flying club and have a nice cup of tea. And I'll fly with you next time.